Welcome. Welcome to the webinar today. As people are coming into the room, um, I'd like to ask folks to type into the chat how you're feeling about, um, about this session today and where are you zooming in from? So I'll just say that again for anyone who just joined. Um, welcome, this is Nicole Anderson from Alumni Career Services. Thanks for being on the webinar today. While we're waiting for others to join, if you wouldn't mind typing into the chat um, a word or two about how you're feeling today, feeling about this session. And we'd love to know where you are zooming in from. Joining from campus, that's cool. <laughs> Wait. So we know we're having it, we're going to have a smaller group today, but I still want to wait a, a minute yeah, or two that's to see fine what with else me. we can get in. Yeah. Oh, Seattle, Washington. Ah. Oh, Savannah, Georgia. <laughs> Go dogs. I love it. Okay, let's see. Kathleen says having trouble with audio. Hmm. Let me see. Oh, She can hear now. Great. All right. So one more minute and then we will begin. If you haven't done so already, let us know where you're zooming in from. Put that in the chat. And maybe a word or two about how you're feeling about the webinar today. All right, so I think we'll begin. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Nicole Anderson, and I oversee Alumni Career Services and career mentoring for Tufts alums and students. Welcome to the webinar today. Our webinar is The Impact of What Impacts You, featuring Michael Bolognino of Michael Bolognino Life and Career Coaching. We have two main goals in our alumni career programs, and those are to present programs like this, um, including webinars and networking events and, um, in fact, in-person events around the country and uh, for all alums in all schools. And you can find um, those events listed on the Alumni and Friends calendar on our website, and I'll drop that link into the chat. Um, our second goal is to foster connections between alumni and alumni and students. And you can check out your school's career center on uh, the Alumni and Friends page. I'll put a link in there if you want to look for more resources um, and events and programs that are um, tailored to you, to, your, um, to where you graduated from. So to, for today's webinar, 
uh, we'll be presenting for about 50 minutes and we'll try our best to address all the questions. I invite you to ask questions in the chat box um, during, you know, during the webinar and I will feed those to Michael. Um, and then, you know, we'll, Michael will also be doing some interactive um, things during, during the webinar. So he might be asking you to, you know, um, enter answers into the chat. And then at the end, we'll save some time to address questions there. Um, this webinar is being recorded and it will be available to you on our YouTube playlist after the event. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I do want to acknowledge that the Office of Alumni Engagement has a community value statement, and I'll post that in the chat box as well. The statement is, um, our mission invokes an environment of mutual respect, free expression, and inquiry. Program participants accept these principles when they join this community, and in doing so, they agree to abide by the following community values, to respect respect for the rights, differences, experiences, and dignity of others, express our viewpoints in a thoughtful and respectful manner, honesty and integrity in working with all members of the community and accountability for personal behavior. Last, I wanna mention another housekeeping item, which is you can keep your video on or off during the session. It's up to you, um, but we do have you muted. So that's why we'd like you to um, ask questions in the chat. So let's learn about Michael. After studying creative writing and communications media studies at Tufts, Michael spent 20 plus years in marketing with the last 13 at Google, um, leading product and brand marketing campaigns and eventually running operations for social. Following a, why am I so unfulfilled while working at one of the best companies in the world, identity crisis in early 2018, Michael discovered that only he was in charge of his career and life. And after taking a good hard look at what really lit him up, he realized that after two decades of marketing to people, he really wanted to find a way to work more directly with people. Later that year, Michael was certified as a co-active ICF coach and has since been helping clients discover their inner potential and make an impact on their lives, careers, and relationships. In July, 2023, he resigned from Google to focus on his coaching practice. Michael lives in the Berkshires at the Philomena, a 19th century rectory that he and his husband, Nick, renovated and run as an occasional Airbnb and photo shoot destination. And you can check him out on his website, www.michaelbolomino.com. And um, we'll provide other um um, his email address, and he'll talk about that at the end if you want to get in touch with him. So now I will hand the presentation over to Michael. Beautiful. Nicole, thank you so much for that introduction. It's wild to hear about myself from someone else. Uh, so thank you for, for getting into that. And hello to everyone that joined. I'm really glad you're here. I'm supremely glad to be back at Tufts, even though I'm not there. Um, I'm close. Like Nicole said, I'm in the Berkshires, so about two hours away. And um, you know, I'm going to tell you in a second why Tufts alumni is so important to me, um, but I, it is something that I'd like to get more involved with. So thank you for, for showing up and being here. Um, okay, so Nicole covered a lot of this, but I'm still going to go over it briefly. Um, I grew up in Albany, New York, not far from here. I went to college in Boston. I lived in uh, San Francisco, Seattle, New York, and now I'm full time up here with my husband and my two dogs. Um, and I do have a few chickens, too. Um, I thought it would be fun to go back into my archives and find some relics of my time at Tufts. So I don't know how, at what time period you all uh, went to Tufts, but when I went, it was before the internet, basically. So they sent us all this book, a hard copy book of everyone's faces and some basic information. It looks like I said I like hiking and swimming, which that's accurate. And I was pre-med, which I find to be hilarious. But um you know, this was a very handy tool for me because I was, you know, I got to see what my roommate looked like. And, you know, I may have snooped around to see like who seemed like they could be friendly or even someone to date, but that's for a different presentation. Uh, as far as my time at Tufts, I had a truly transformative experience, but I'd say the two things that stood out the most were swimming uh, on the left here and concert board. Swimming is the reason I went to Tufts. So at the time there was a coach, Don Magerly, He's still at Tufts actually, but um, I met him and I was so interested in him and how he ran the team that basically I chose Tufts because of swimming. 
Um, and I, it, 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 the swimming changed my life and led me here. And, and as you'll see in my story, there's a lot of these chain of events that got me where I am and swimming is one of them. Concert board, I don't know if it's still there. I hope it is, but basically we had the coolest job in the world. We got to figure out who got to come and play music at Spring Fling every year. And we brought bands like Ben Folds 5 and LL Cool J and even Outkast. And one time I had to take this van and go to Logan Airport and I picked up the rap group Sugar Hill Gang, which was hilarious. It was me and them, but we had a good, we had a good ride. Um, okay. And I do, I mentioned before that the alumni network is really important to me. Back in 2001, I was living in Seattle. I, I was working at Starbucks. I moved out there for love. I had no corporate job experience. And I dialed in, and at that time, there was a bulletin board for Tufts alumni. And I, there was a job for this company called Cranium that made books and games and toys. And I just threw it out. I threw an email out to the, the person that went to Tufts. And I said, you know, I'm interested. And he wrote me back immediately. I was on my way out to work at Starbucks. And he said, write me a cover letter immediately about why you want this job. And, and the rest is history. Basically, um, w this alumni network allowed me to get this job at at Google, or excuse me, at Cranium, which then led me to all these other uh, experiences in my life. So I really, it was such a pivotal time, uh, a pivotal experience that I had to mention it. Okay, so Nicole covered most of this, but I just want to give you some context of me in the work sense. My first job was at my dad's deli. It was called Roma's, and I was arranging bread and working the cash register. Uh, after Cranium, I worked at a few startups, and then I got the job at Google, like Nicole said, for 13 years. Uh, my husband and I do um, live in a house that's also kind of a business. And so, you know, one thing that's become important to me as I left Google was multiple streams of income. So that's that was a, a big piece of this puzzle. And then uh, right here, this is from my website. I am currently a coach, like Nicole said, and basically it's a dream job. I get to help people figure their lives out, which, um, you know, I didn't know that was a job, actually. So I get this question a lot. What kind of coach are you? You know, you've heard a life coach, executive coach, leadership coach, creative coach. There's a million flavors. Um, and frankly, I don't even like the word coach. But what I would say is that I'm a human coach and this is not a cop out. What I mean by that is there's a through line with all my clients. Basically, they've come to me because there's somewhere where they're stuck. There's something where they want to make a change. Maybe they don't even know what it is, but it, it really unites them all. So it's a human being that I'm coaching. And I also coach the whole person, not just the work element of their lives. Um, and yeah, I kind of touched on this, but basically we get into where are you now and where do you want to go? Okay, so now that the introductions are behind us, let's get into this actual uh, workshop. So I want to co-design it. And all that I mean by that is uh, basically make some general agreements. I don't want to just talk at you. Uh, I am going to ask a few simple questions. It would really help if you did pop in some answers in the chat box just to get this going. Um, and, you know, I will be using a lot of examples from my own career journey, but it would be nice if we could get some people to chime in about their own. Okay, so what are we going to discuss, discuss today? Uh, basically, it's how to make the most of your work, and most importantly, do it in a way that's fulfilling, and then also building towards something that's bigger than yourself. So that's a lot of words, but basically what we're going to focus on today is impact and understanding impact. And impact has a million de uh, definitions, and this is where you come in. I want to start really broad. Does anyone want to throw out what their definition of impact is? Or like, what, what does impact mean to you? And this could be any answer related to work or life or anything. And for those who join late, we're asking you to put it in the chat. All right, nice. Kathleen, I see it there. It says making a meaningful difference. Beautiful. What else? What about in the context of work? What does impact mean? Okay, well, I will, I'll give you a hint. This graph, usually when we think about impact in a work context, it means, are we getting more users? Are we getting more followers? Are we driving revenue? And all that is critical, right? This workshop is not to say that that's not important, but if we only focus on the outward metrics, so how our company's performing, um, we actually miss a lot of critical data that could make our that the impact that we have with that work stronger. So let me say that again. If we just focus on the end result, uh, we miss a lot of information that can help us figure out how to get more in tune with what we actually care about and like, which can then make the work that we put out better. 
So we'll go over this again and again, but here's the thesis of this session. The more we connect with what impacts us about our work, the more impact we can have via our work. So I also wanna pause here. Does anyone have a reaction to this or any questions about this statement? Okay, we can come back to it if so, but it seems I'll assume that it's somewhat clear. So we are gonna focus here on going beyond those results and really understanding what is it about your work that makes you happy, that makes you satisfied, and how can we use that to make you deliver more? Um, how will we know we're successful today? My metric is this, if you're in the shower tomorrow morning, if you're making dinner tonight and you think, oh, what's impacting me about my work? I, I know that we'll have made at least a small difference. So that's our goal today, is just to plant this seed of focusing on impact on ourselves. Before we get to the impact part, it's really important that we look at where we're struggling. Uh, a lot of times when we're stuck, I see this with my clients all the time, um, there's so much power in these kind of negative thoughts and negative thinking, and it's pretty easy to take away some of that power by speaking it. And there's also a lot of information if you look at where am I stuck? So this brings me to the S word. This is also where the community here comes in. Anyone wanna guess what the S word is in the context of being stuck? It's not stuck, <laughs> I can say that. Shit, okay, it could be shit, but in this case, it's not shit, but you know, it's in the ballpark. Um, no, it's should, so you were really close. Um, should is such a dangerous word, right? I mean, should is, we tend to think we know what we want and, and how to be fulfilled, but a lot of times we create these expectations on ourselves and not only are, us creating them, our families create these, our cultures create these, our leaders cre create these. No, it's all good, Michael. Um, this should concept comes from inside of us and from outside of us. And, and regardless where it's from, if we're thinking in the should mindset, it's gonna stop us from going where we need to go. So I'm gonna try to give you some tools for how to neutralize shoulds so that we can then focus on impact. The first step really is looking more closely at them and asking some questions. I'm gonna do it by going through an example of my own. So rewind to 2018. I was in a, in a pretty dark place. I had been at Google for eight years at this point. I had gone through a reorg. I was on a team that really limited what I could do. And uh, I just was outside of work struggling. So, so struggling so badly that my husband and I were arguing a lot. And basically he had a wake up call for me. He said, uh, you know, if you don't figure this out, like, I'm not sure how, if we should be getting married and I'll get into that a little bit more, but that was for me kind of like, okay, I need to pay attention here. So my should was I'm a creative person who should be working on creative work, but I'm stuck doing partnerships with phone manufacturers like Samsung basically, and being the opposite of creative. That was the belief I had that I was stuck. And so these are three questions that I could have asked myself to try to figure out how to neutralize this should. The first is, is it or is part of it in my control? The next one is, what are the actual thoughts surrounding this should? And then the third one is, why is it important to me that it's different? Why do I want it to be different? So if we run through the first question in my example, which is here in the top corner, I should be working on more creative work. Um, is it in my control? Frankly, at first I thought it's not in my control. It's the fault of my role. It's the fault of my manager. It's the fault of Google. Like I tried a million ways to get help and they weren't helping me, but I actually didn't go deep enough. Looking back now, I know that I just had to reimagine what creativity meant to me and where to find it. Uh, and, and, and I'll show you how we do that. Um, the second question to neutralize a should, what are the actual thoughts surrounding it? And this is where you wanna be like really profuse and really get it out. They're just thoughts. These are not real facts. So like listing them out, verbalizing them really steals away some of their power. So in this case, I was thinking to myself, I'm totally stuck in a role that's not a fit. I'm miserable and I'm being underutilized. My creative skills are being wasted. And I was even questioning my self-worth. I said to myself, like, maybe I'm not even creative. Maybe people aren't seeing my value. Maybe I don't have value at all. Like I was, it was a really, it was a real low point. So if I had known that I could try to articulate some of these voices, 
um, I think I would have had a faster time getting to where, getting to clarity. The third question for neutralizing shoulds, this is really important. Why do I want it to be different? This isn't what do I want to be different? This is why is it important to me? So in this, in this case, I wanted to feel more connected to my own creativity. I wanted to be happier at work. I wanted to be valued and seen for my contribution. And I wanted to know and articulate what I am, what I'm good at. And I think that's basically like how I got to this concept of impact. Um, so basically, in summary, why are understanding these blockers and these shoulds and critical for impact? Um, if we can address them, we can see more clearly. We can get rid of the the negative self speak, the you know the the conditioning we've had from our families about expectations and all that stuff, and really get clean. And we have to make room to really look at what we care about. It's gonna if we're all cluttered with all these shoulds, it's gonna make the process harder. So a quick recap, these are the three questions I suggest if you are feeling stuck and you're using that should word a lot. First is, is it in my control or is part of it? If the answer is yes, go deeper, kind of like I explained. If not, that's your answer. If it's not in your control, it's more about making peace with it. Two, what are the actual thoughts surrounding it? Be honest and profuse. Get it all out. Let it rip and just be as honest as you can with yourself about why you're stuck. And then third, why do I want it to be different? The emphasis is on why, like I said, it's not how. How do you want to feel? Use that as a marker for what you're going to track towards as you do the work. Okay, so I hinted at this previously, but I did not neutralize my should back in 2018, and it got really dangerous. Uh, I got trapped in my blocker, and it led to a crash. And, and like Nicole said in my introduction, I was struggling so hard because I thought, well, I'm at this like incredible company to work for, Google, and I'm so fulfilled. Every day I wake up unfulfilled. I feel like something's missing. And this is when, like, it, the low point was when my husband looked at me and said, like I said, I don't know if we should proceed with our wedding if you can't straighten this out. And from that point, I knew I had to focus on this. And I realized that I was in charge of it. Like, no one else was going to help me do this. I had to figure out what to do next. And then this is what I just said, but basically um, as helpful as companies are, as Google is your manager, at the end of the day, you have to be in charge of kind of dictating your own pathway. And um, until I realized that I didn't have a lot of power and I kind of got stuck in that negative place. So from this point, I said, okay, I'm gonna define what I actually want, but I had no idea where to start. So I was, I was at a conference actually, and I was, I had this little notebook that they gave me and I made this really rough approximation in two columns, things that I like and things that I'm good at. And this is very simple. And it's all, it was also very fun and playful and dare I say, silly, like things that I like on that list include tarot cards, estate sales, um, the woods. I mean, also on their podcasts, connecting, et cetera. And then things I'm good at cooking, giving advice, which I should have paid attention to because you know, now I'm a coach, communication, project management, et cetera. So this was a very rudimentary start. And I'm showing this to just say this was kind of step zero to getting clearer on, on impact. But at this point, I didn't know impact was what was important. I was just kind of brainstorming, like, what do I like? Um, and again, I tried to make it fun. Uh, where the magic happens is understanding why why these things that you like make a difference to you. So I locked myself in a conference room in the office and I gave myself 45 minutes. And basically I made a really simple table and I asked myself these three simple questions, emphasis on simple. I feel like for me personally, as the easier it is, the more likely it is I'm gonna do it. So I identified a bunch, six projects that I thought were my favorite, most proud projects. Um, at Google and beyond. And I asked myself, why were they my favorite? What lit me up about doing them? And what was I most proud of? And this is what it looked like. And this is just a rough approximation, but basically I listed the project on the left side. And then on the right side, I just started writing and writing and writing uh, just descriptions of why the project was important to me. So let me run you through a few examples so you can see what I mean. Um, okay, so back, when Obama got elected the same day, Proposition 8 uh, failed in 
or excuse me, it passed in California and it made gay marriage illegal. And the reason that this is relevant is because at the time I was working at a company that made wikis. I don't know if you remember wikis, but basically there are online communities. And so uh, the project was putting together uh, a digital resource for people who wanted to protest against this passing. Uh, it was, and so I was thinking about why is that, why was that project relevant? What was the impact on me? And so I came up with this list. So gay rights are personal and important to me. I liked being hands-on. So basically um, I worked with this blogger who had a list of all the locations of uh, protests and we just created a simple website wiki where it listed them all so people knew where to go. Um, it made a difference to people and it was bigger than me. Really, really important to me. I also saw an opportunity to simplify what someone else was doing, this blogger that I mentioned. It was something that others could experience and it got press coverage and it helped my company, uh, which at the time was called Wet Paint. Okay, so then I thought, well, why don't I try to boil this down and come up with a category for each of these things that impacted me? So the translation of gay rights being important to me was that it was a personal personal passion. Um, being hands-on and making, I called building and creating. I came up with real impact on other people. That showed up twice. Helping, which is similar. And then also accolades. Like it's important for me to include like the reality, which is that if I do something that, you know, makes my manager happy or makes the company happy, that meant, meant something to me. So I included it on the list. Uh, second project that I ran this through uh, was a really fun one. Basically, we had a problem with Google Docs, which was that basically only men were using it and talking about not using it, but like we wanted to create conversation around it, but it was really tech men in tech who were the ones that were leading the conversation. So we wanted to bring women into the equation. So we came up with this concept where we paired two female artists. One of them is Lizzo and she was, she was not the Lizzo of today then, but it's pretty awesome that it was Lizzo. But basically we paired them up and we said, use Google Docs to write a song without ever meeting in person, do it on Google Meet, uh, write it in there. And then we flew them to New York and we recorded the song and we put it out on Google Play as an exclusive. So I thought, well, I loved this project, but why? Again, so here's the reasons that I came up with. I'm a huge fan of music. The song had a powerful message. The music business was a new territory for me. I had worked in tech for so long and I had never seen the other side of the music business. Um, we created a, so a song and we created something new in a behind the scenes video. Um, I liked managing all the agencies and the stakeholders. And we also addressed a problem that Docs was having, which I outlined. So same thing. What are the categories? How can I how can I start to identify trends if I can I, if I can label each of these things with a with a category? So the categories I came up with for this project were it's a personal passion. Again, here's real impact on on real people. Uh, it was a stretch. I was learning about a new side of the business. Um, I was building and creating. I was leading teams of agencies, and I was creative problem solving. Okay. So before we get to the third example, I want to point out. Much like a partner, you can't get everything from one place. So even though Google is you know, very dynamic and lots of opportunities, it's really critical that you look at projects or things outside of work that impacted you and run it through the same exercise. And one of my beliefs is that outside feeds inside. And I could have a whole other workshop on that, but basically there's a lot available to you um, in terms of what impacts you that has nothing to do with your work. And so we have to look there too and see what we can find. And my third example was renovating my house with my husband. So basically we, we use a lot of YouTube. Um, we did everything we could without getting a permit to renovate our house. And it was, a, it was a very, very challenging, but very rewarding project. So I ran it through the same process again. I love a big hairy challenge. Like when I walked in here, I had no idea what I was doing. We had never touched, basically never touched a hammer before. Um, but I knew we would get it done. Um, the goal of this place was always to share it with others as our friends, our family, rentals, et cetera. Um, I loved, and at times I hated my coworker, but then my husband, hate is a strong word, but as you can imagine, it really pushes on like all elements of a relationship. But the point there is we were collaborating together. I enjoyed managing the budgets and the orders and the contractors. I was thrilled to get my hands on and demo walls and, you know, learn how to um, like patch drywall. 
And we also supported our community and our local economy. That impacted me because we're, we live in a small town in the Berkshires. And, you know, there's a lot of tension with city folk and local folk. So I wanted to do something that gave back. And so this will be surprising, but here are some of the categories that I came up with, again, for a non-work project. It was a stretch project. It had real impact. It was a team project. We were building and creating. Uh, it was a creative outlet and it had a real impact again. So as you can see, themes start developing. And from six projects, okay, thanks guys. From six projects, um, I ended up with 15 categories. And of those 15 categories, the four that came up most were building, creating, and making, having real impact on real people, channeling chaos into order, and leadership. So you may be asking, okay, so what good is that? Now you have these tenants, like, you know, what are you going to do with them? There's actually a ton of benefits if you can get clear on, on what your impact tenants are. The first is just is simple, clarity about what impacts you and why. And that goes a long way because it helps you get, get a crisp, clear way to articulate what your strengths are. I, I bet if I asked you right now what your strengths are, you would probably have a good answer. What if you had created some impact tenants and you were able to say your strengths and tie them to the projects that actually impacted you? That's what this exercise can help us with. It's a really good way to speak to past projects. That comes in handy when you're in interviews or when you are you know, talking about a promotion. Uh, it's, it's just a good way to tie in what impacts you to where you wanna go or why you're the right person for a job. And it's also a very handy tool for writing your resume, doing your performance review, uh, writing your development plans, et cetera. So let's see it in practice. So on the right, this is my Google resume when I was working there. And basically I used my tenants to write this really tight summary at the top of my resume that explains who I am. So if someone came and read this and the only thing they read was this paragraph, it would tell a story. And the paragraph says, when I look back across my work over the last 15 plus years at the projects I consider to have been the most successful and rewarding, a through line of four key themes emerges. Real impact on real people, building, creating, and making, channeling chaos into order, and leading a team. And that, that kind of succinct description is something that I did not have. And it helped me figure out what I had to do next now that I understood what kind of work I wanted to do. And so it allowed me to advocate for myself. So at the time, I was working, like I said, with phone manufacturers, which was fine, but it was not a passion of mine. So I went to my boss with my tenants in my back pocket, and I advocated to try to just work on a project that was on a different team. It was called Social Lab and see if she'd let me try it. I knew I could nail it. I knew I would love it. It was with influencers. It was a big, um, it was in a big studio. Like there were just a lot of elements I was very excited to, or ex excuse me, excited about. And they went for it. And again, just to reiterate, like this project had my tenants in there. I was leading a team. It was very chaotic. We had eight different uh, influencers that were all doing different things and all the eight different rooms that were built out. Um, people were impacted by the content that they made, et cetera. So it was a really good introduction for myself. And then it also led <clears throat> to my most fulfilling work at Google. When I when I resigned from Google, it was probably the best job, the best fit for me that I'd had in all 13 years. I was leading operations for Social Lab. And not to hit you over the head with it too many times, but all of my tenants are in there. When you think of operations, building and creating and making, you're creating tools to help people, impact on real people. In this case, it was my fellow Googlers who were running social. I was helping them do their jobs better, be more efficient, get better results. Channeling chaos, I mean, social is incredibly chaotic. Uh, there's nothing but chaos. So I had a lot of opportunity to clean things up and put processes together and help people be organized. And then again, leadership. I was leading a team of 20 and we were, we were trying to aggressively change. How do you, how does an organization like Google that has 700 social channels, how do you get them to be efficient and how do you get them to be, uh, you know, worth the investment? So having that kind of leadership role was, was really critical for me. And I would not have gotten it, I wouldn't have, if I hadn't understood what I actually cared about. And then of course, my confidence to exit Google 
also came right back to these tenants. And I know you're sick of them by now, but I'm going to say them again, because as a coach, I get to build and create and make with clients. We get to, we get to build their plans and their, and figure out their dreams, real impact. That's all we do. You know, if I do my job right, I'm impacting a human being whose life is going to be more fulfilled, channeling chaos into order. You know, a lot of times clients come to me and they have no idea what they want. They know they want something else, but they don't know what they want. They know they want to change, but they have no idea which direction to change. That's a sense. That's a sort of chaos. And then leadership too. You know, I, I guess it's not that I lead one-on-one -on -one clients. This is more in the industry. So I'm trying to make networks with other coaches. I'm trying to create, you know, unique offerings in this space that don't exist. So for me, it's a very, very fulfilling uh, place to be. And it, like I said, it's a culmination of this exercise that I did back when I was stuck, back when I said, I'm going to get real simple here and figure out what it, what it is that I like. Without that exercise, I don't think I would have left Google. Um, maybe I would have had a breakdown. I'm not kidding. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have the life that I have. So uh, if there's, you know, one, one kind of summary of that, it's of this, of this deck, I should say, or this strategy, asking yourself questions to neutralize those shoulds and those blockages, focusing on the impact on you first. Again, it's, it's really important that the work we do affects the bottom line of our companies, that it drives usage, et cetera. But focus on the impact on you first, because that's how you make a dent in the company's impact. And then define and speak to your tenants. Do the exercise. Get clear on what you care about. Figure out how you can articulate it into useful uh, you know, descriptions and into your resume, et cetera. And then they'll become uh, like messaging points that you'll draw back to over and over again. And then also, as you're doing your general work day to day, pay attention to the impact of what's your projects that are happening now. Like how, what, what impacts you about them in a positive way? What's not impacting you about them? Uh, it's always good to kind of have your lens open thinking about that. Um, another important note on this, it didn't happen overnight. This was five years ago that it started. And I'm not saying that it's going to take everyone or it takes everyone five years to get clear on this. But in my case, um, you know, that was my journey. And yes, I could have left a couple of years sooner, but I wasn't ready. And I think for me, having this flashlight like the point here is it's not a switch where it was clear. It was more like a flashlight that I gave myself so I could look around and really understand what do I care about and then use that to basically change change the flow um, of my life. And to summarize again, I'm just going to read, read to you this benefit, or excuse me, this core belief. Uh, the more of we connect to what impacts us about our work, the more impact we can have via our work. So I want to open it up for questions at this point. Uh, there is an exercise that we can do if people are interested, but I would really like to have a discussion about what you heard today, what makes sense, where you're stuck, what you think your impacts are. Like, I, I would really like to start this, uh, start to have more of a two-way situation here. So does anyone have any, any questions or any kind of discussion points? I realize that I just talked for 30 minutes straight. So thank you for listening. Uh, but this is this is the part where ideally you can push me on things that I said. You can question it. You can give me examples. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a question for Nicole. Yeah, I think I can unmute her. Um, if that's okay, Michael. Yeah, yeah, I'd rather it be that way. Yes. Yeah. So let's see. Okay. And that was Hannah, right? Oh, awesome. Cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, I first I just want to say thank you so much for coming and talking. Um, I just love like everything you just said. Um, and it, it's actually just so timely. Like it all, almost feels like a sign, like literally, because I'm a senior um who's probably graduating um this spring. So I've been thinking a lot about all of this. Um, and something that I kind of keep coming back to and that I've been grappling a little bit with as um related to what you've been talking about is kind of 
trying to figure out like what my tenants are and, and leaning into both just like giving myself sort of permission to like think about what I like and don't like versus like what's mm. maybe sort of a lucrative career and what I feel like I should be doing, S word. Um, and yeah. I mean, I guess I'm just kind of curious if you have any thoughts on like how to sort of balance those two things of like, okay, like this is something that I feel like I'm good at and I'm really interested and passionate about, but then the other sort of flip side is like, maybe it's not sort of a traditionally or stereotypically like prestigious or like, you know, lucrative, I guess, career. I mean, maybe you didn't have to deal with that as much at Google per se, but um, I guess maybe a little more background to help with that. Like I major in economics and entrepreneurship. Last summer I worked at PwC in like a consulting position and like it was a cool experience, but I just was like, this is just not for me. So that's good information to have. Um, but I really am like interested in psychology and like even like getting like a PsyD or something in the clinician, like therapist route, which is like complete 360, I guess, or 180, whatever. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, sorry. That was, that was a little lengthy, but if that oh, makes sense to you. Total sense. It's a beautiful thing. And I, I want to point out, you said permission. I think that's, let's start there because mm -hmm. this does require giving yourself permission to kind of explore. And I, it's, it sounds silly that we would have to ask ourselves permission, but it's like, it's true because yeah. we're so focused on all the other things we have to do and making everything else successful that we often deprioritize ourselves. So that's my first okay. response. Permission is key and everyone deserves permission. Mm -hmm. uh, that's number one. Second, you know, it's so interesting that you're like, you use the word lucrative a few times. Um, I would say like, how can you flip that? Because there is a, there's a, there's a tenant in there, mm -hmm. which I, I think which is yeah. the opposite of, so you, maybe you know that it's not about the, like the lucrative part, but if, if it's things like psychology or, you know, the other examples you gave, what are some of those elements? Like, why? I would ask yourself that, like, what is it about those things? So it's kind of a dual, a dual activity. I would, I would do the impact exercise real simple. Mm -hmm. I would also say, okay, well, now that I've kind of articulated that, I think I want to be in this world. Why? Like, what is it about that world that's attracting me there? Right. And then the other thing I'd say on the topic of the, like the should, the bad word concept is like, there's the bug in your ear clearly about of lucrative, like there's something there about like what, what makes a good job. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not want to put words in your mouth, but I'm hearing some <laughs> kind of limiting belief. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you from my experience, what really helps me, you know, making the decision to leave Google was probably the hardest decision I've ever had to make. And I kept putting it off because I was waiting to not be scared. And I realized the thing that was holding me back is that I thought I had to make my Google salary in order to leave. Mm -hmm. And that was a limiting belief for me because that actually wasn't true. What I had to do was look at my finances and really understand like, what do I spend money on? What do I want my life to look like? What does that cost, right? Mm -hmm. So I broke that down. And then once I tangibly saw that, that limiting belief of, oh, I have to make my exact Google salary went away. And now mm. it's five months in and I can tell you it's working. Like I know what I need to make and I'm not killing myself to do it. And I'm doing it to have the life that I want versus to have the prestige of a, you know, a six figure salary or whatever. Right. Answer your question. And do you have any follow-ups? Yeah, no, that completely answers my question. And that, yeah, that's really interesting. And that kind of, I feel like that that touches on like kind of what I, I thought you would say, but it's kind of just helpful to like hear you say it, especially from sort of like external, like third, you know, like other person who isn't like as involved. Because sometimes it's it's easy to get bogged down by like all different voices, like friends and parents and yeah. professors and and trying to get super clear on like, why do I actually want that thing? Like, what is that drawing me towards? And what I think is drawing me towards is maybe I could achieve it another way or I could give to myself yeah. or that kind of thing. So yeah, totally. that was super helpful. Thank you. Oh, good. And it even makes me think when I showed that picture of the, the yearbook from when I went to Tufts, yeah. it said I wanted to be pre-med and that was never my- Exactly. <laughs> it was not my dream. Yeah. That was my family's dream as immigrants. That was like somebody else's thing, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, it took a minute to figure that out. But like what I'm hearing is that you have some thoughts that are a little different than maybe what you thought you should do or what other people do. And like yes. you're trying to figure out what are they and what do they mean? So mm -hmm. I think you're actually in a great place. And Thank so like, just to like put a point on it, 
if you can give yourself permission to do it and start small, that's key too. I think you'll start figuring out a little bit more details. Yeah, definitely. That's super helpful. Thank you. Very validating. <laughs> oh, no, of course. Thank you, Hannah. Of course. Okay. Looks like there's another question in the chat. Nicole, do you want me to read it or do you want to read it? So this is from Kathleen. Um, not necessarily a question. Okay. But she is, you know, it has been in a job search for a while. It's been really tough. She yep. has two master's degrees from mm -hmm. Tufts. And um, I think she's like, she likes what you're saying. Um, and this is timely for her. This is going to help her in upcoming interviews. Um, and in fact, she has a second interview next week. She's really nervous. Um, but she plans to use these questions as a jumping off, jumping off point. Um, Kathleen, feel free to ask a, a, a direct question or to follow up on that in the chat. Or if you'd like me to Oh, she wants me to unmute her. Hold on a quick cool. second. Here we go. Um, where are my participants? <laughs> She's eager for me to, uh, there we go. Hi, uh, hi, this is Kathleen. Thank you so much. I, yeah, I I, I said in my comment, I, I was laid off in March and I graduated with masters from the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy and Urban and Environmental Policy and Planning. And I did something kind of unconventional with my degrees right after I graduated. I went to work for a startup and that startup is now having issues. <laughs> They've had a series of layoffs this, this year. Um, and I think that I wanna pivot. So what I did at that startup was um, corporate communications for a food tech company um, making, uh, it doesn't really matter, making whey protein, but without cows. Um, so still touching on food, but I really wanna stay in the food industry, but I think that I want to pivot into policy, which is not exactly what I did in my last role. Um, I'm finding it very hard to uh, convince potential employers that like, I have the education. I just want to put it into practice. Like, yes, I did something a little bit different right out of grad school, but, um, but like, I, I do really feel that I have these skills and this strength. I just need the opportunity to practice them. Um, I don't, it's been, it's been a challenge. It's been really demoralizing. There's been many times when I've been like, why did I get two master's degrees in this subject? Oh. Um, but I do have a second interview actually coming up this Friday um, with an organization that I'm really excited about. I my first my first conversation with them was scheduled for 30 minutes and it went for an hour, which I felt like was a good sign. Um, but I'm a little bit scared to like put too much hope in in it because I've I've just been in this cycle of like application rejection, application rejection, application rejection. Hmm. Okay. Thank you for sharing all that and being so raw about it. I want to say a few things. First, it makes sense that it's demoralizing. Um, it's hard. It's really hard out there. And I think also when you get laid off, even though it's absolutely not about you, it's really hard to not take that as a hit. And so what I'm hearing also is this kind of combination of being laid off and then the rejections and then also like all the work you've put in with your degrees. Like It all makes sense to me. Uh, but I, but I, I think there's still a lot of hope. I know there's a lot of hope. And so my question to you would be, what is it about food? Like, why is that something that you want to like, why that, that sector I'd start there. And then I'd also say like, what do you know about this company or this interview? Uh, what are they trying to mine and understand about you? Do you have a sense of that? So those would be my two initial questions. Uh, Yeah. I think that I I can articulate. I, I don't know if this is the place to to get into all of it, but I I I like food because I I feel that the food system is such a lens on broader um just broader things happening in our society. You can look at it from like a land use perspective, you can look at it from an, a, a food justice and equity perspective, you can look at it through a nutrition lens. Like there's just like so many different ways that food touches our lives. Um, so that is like, I think why I am interested in the food sector. Um, what, what they're trying to understand about me is something that I have a, a much harder time parsing. Okay. Um, yeah. Can you, can you 
I mean, I, if you're comfortable, can you share a, like a snippet of what it is? What do you mean? Like, oh, you, you mean parsing like you're not sure what they want? I thought you meant you're not sure, uh, I guess, how to re respond to them. So what is it? Is well, it yeah, I, like I have a harder time figuring out what it is that they are looking for so that I can speak because interviews are so cryptic. <laughs> Totally. There's been, like we're trying to figure out everything about you without actually like directly asking you what we want to know <laughs> like that's what it feels like I think that's there so okay there's something there because it's it basically what I hear you saying is like it's this inauthentic way to kind of get to an answer about what about who you are so my recommendation would be being as you as you can be and going in there they're they're hiring you right so if you can go in there and and be able to articulate and kind of like what we talked about here today like what it is about the food sector this company specifically that that you know like your experience and your desire lead you like why why are you there if you can get clear for yourself on that i think that any question they answer, ask you you should be able to answer because it should come from just the essence of who you are and that may sound like oversimplifying but it's true because if they're playing games, if the game is like asking questions that are like trying to trick you, if you're answering them honestly, that's uh, what else can you do? If you have to create a fake answer, first of all, it's going to confuse you and you're going to be thinking about the fake answer. And then second of all, that's not really you. So that that would be what I would say. And I would also say, I'd be happy to talk to you for a half hour before Friday if you want. Um, I'd be happy to run through some specifics. I know I'm putting you on blast right now, asking you some you know, questions, but um, I'd be happy to talk to you if that would be useful. Um, okay, let me let me think about that because um, Nicole also offered something similar. <laughs> uh, well, it's and, on the table. Okay, I appreciate that a lot. Yeah, totally. But any any questions about what I just said? Like, also, if you you can call bullshit on me too. Like, I just I'm just curious. Like, what did you take away from what I said? Um. No, what, what I took away, like, I, I actually think that the, the three questions that you recommend that we, like, think about for ourselves um, and even write down are useful. I want to I wanna spend some time with your questions just on my own, um, trying to articulate the answers there and, and figuring out, like, what are my tenets. I think that's a useful framework for, Good. Uh, I hope, I, I hope and I expect that it's a useful framework for um being able to like talk about my accomplishments easier i i'm gonna spend some time thinking about the projects that i really liked working on in my last role and Good. use those so thanks Good. and i want to say one last thing which is it's it, it's 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 remains incredibly valuable that you got those two degrees like how can you flip that into a, a point of power versus a point of questioning yourself like, what did you learn there? You worked hard. Like you, you did something that is a more. It's you. You did extra. Like it's something that you should try to flip into a strength versus a regret. And I know that's easier said than done, but I'm telling you the truth. Like those things are valuable. They may not directly lead you to your next job, but mm -hmm. if you can release some of that, whatever feeling is, I'm not gonna try to name it. If you can release some of that, it's gonna help you. Okay. Thanks. Okay, cool. Thank you. It looks like William or Teresa. I, I'm not, I'm assuming it's William, but has a question. William. Okay. William. You have to come on camera because we're twins. Oh, we're twins. <laughs> Look at that. Yes. Um, sorry. <laughs> I was on my phone before and walking around, but um, thank you so much for this um, presentation. Um, I know we're close to the hour mark, so I'll make it brief, but um yeah, but just it's kind of nice to tell one story briefly uh, and hear other people's stories. Um, but I was a psych major at Tufts. I graduated ten years ago, and I worked a lot of different kinds of jobs. Um, I worked in carpentry, restaurants, film. Um, then I went to divinity school, and I got a master in divinity. I worked as a chaplain, and then I worked in research at a nonprofit. And I had a bad boss, and I left after I stayed as long as I could. I really liked the work. Um, and then I left and I'm in a, also a similarly, you know, six month, um, employment gap and I'm looking at maybe going back to school or, and I'm looking at different jobs and I'm, you know, comparing my 
different interests. You know, I also like to cook. I also like um, photography. I also like, you know, the things that I like and trying to figure out what belongs in the avocation bucket and what belongs in the vocation bucket. And I have talked to a career counselor, but I don't think I had the right chemistry or something with that person. So, cause I didn't feel motivated to do, you know, the homework that they gave me basically. And so I think was commenting on, I feel more motivated by this conversation and I'm grateful for that. And, um, I may reach out to you if that's possible, but yeah. You know, it's just cool to, I don't really have a specific question. I'd probably ask you a question more detailed, more specific to me in like a longer conversation, if that's possible. But yes, absolutely. Like hearing each other's stories, even just hearing them is can be helpful. Yes, I would be happy to. Um, in fact, you can, I have a, I didn't know I could make a QR code, but I did today. <laughs> <laughs> this is probably the easiest way because my last name is a little, my URL is a little, my last name is. Italian and complex but anyway you can get my website by going there but I don't want this is I, I'm sorry that my first response to you seemed like a promotion I've just, <laughs> no, but, I do, but what I do want to say to you is a couple of things yes the offers on the table to talk to you as well so you can figure out how to how to sign up with me on the website okay. um, the second thing is it sounds like you're someone that has a lot of skills and a lot of interests almost like more than it seems like you kind of know what to do with them yep and 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 I see that's led you to lots of different types of work, which I think is pretty excellent. So I, I feel like this exercise could also help you if you kind of went through maybe in six different careers that you've had, yeah. or like, right? Like the six different U's. See what the through line is, because it may not be as literal as, okay, well, you know, I went to divinity school, so I'm going to do X, or I went to, you know, I like cooking, so I'm going to be a chef. Like mm -hmm. there could actually be other information that would help you find a job that's maybe not what you thought or that's yeah. not specific. So grab some time. We can hash through this. And um, yeah, I'm glad you said something. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, totally. Okay, what do we do now, Nicole? <laughs> no, I don't see any other questions um, in the chat. So, um, well, if you have, I do, I did ask Michael to promote himself. <laughs> so that's why that, that slide is there. And um, so I'll put a plug in too for alumni career services. I'll remind everyone that um, I coach and I, my colleague, Leslie Warner coaches. Um, we meet with alums from the Schools of Arts and Sciences, Engineering, and the School of the Museum of Fine Arts. And um, I will actually send out, after this, I'll send out um, a follow-up email with some of the links I talked about earlier, about events calendar, and about how to schedule appointments either with me or Leslie. Um, or if you're a grad of one of the professional schools, um, you know, you can make an appointment with them too. Um, but We've got. Let's well, can I interrupt you for a second? Yeah. Would you also be up for sharing a link to my exercise in your recap? Because oh. mm -hmm. it's laid out here really, really simply. Uh, so I can I can create a little a little presentation for you if you want because mm -hmm. it seems like there was some interest, and I'd be happy to share that with folks. Um, so I'll send that over to you after the call. Right, and you can you can put in this contact information, your contact information too, which would be great. This your slide, so that they know how to. Yes to the exercise and. Ah, oh, and my oh, got it, got it, got it. Yes, I, I can yeah, do. That. And yes to your yeah. Okay. okay, beautiful. That's great. Okay, well, I, I are we at time, Nicole? It seems like we are. We uh, are. We're at one fifty nine, and I don't see anything else in the chat. So right. you know, thank. Thank you so much. This was great. I really loved having you here, Michael. I knew this would, um, that you would, that, you know, your people would resonate, your stuff would resonate with, with our folks and, uh, and you were very yeah. engaging. So um, thank you everyone for tuning in. I'm hoping yeah. that we'll bring Michael back in the spring. He and I are talking about some interesting things. So stay tuned. And um, yes, thank you so much, Michael. Much thank gratitude you. for you. I want to send it back. Thank you, Nicole, for the opportunity. And for the folks that joined, truly, like the the things that you shared, like you know, are very useful and and helpful for me. And also, just like you, the fact that you showed up, 
and stayed and asked questions, that, that means a lot to me. So thank you very much. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a Thanks. great day.